everyone. Yes, I can see. Welcome to worship together here at Country West. Today is yet another special Sunday. I think every Sunday is super special. But today is the day of Pentecost. My name is Kirsi Gibson and I'm one of the volunteers in our wonderful junior church team. We love to have children here at church. Our junior church leaders, aunties and uncles do a tremendous job in looking after our children each week. Jesus reminds us powerfully that we, adults, are not to hinder children from coming to Jesus. Our responsibility is to encourage children, is to help children come to know Jesus and to gather together. And Jesus so much wants to bless our children. And the best thing for all of us here is that regardless of our age, we are all invited to become children. Children of God. God says that all who will receive Jesus, all who believe in the name of Jesus, are given the right to become children of God. That's amazing. This is a life-changing promise to us to be a child of God. And if we are children of God, the God of all creation is not going to forget about us, about his beloved children. He's promised to be with us. And on this day of Pentecost, we remember that Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. His Holy Spirit comes to us personally. His Holy Spirit comes to us in this precious church family, where we get to be brothers, sisters, mothers, and fathers to each other. We are not alone. Could I please invite the band to come up to the front, please? And um, just to let you know that after the first part of the service, all the children and all the young people are invited to their own groups. We have some wonderful activities uh, for all ages. So now, if you are able to please stand and we'll sing together. <laughs> Oh, 
Father God, 
God, as you hear and see every heart and mind here. Father God, you are the God of new creation, God of resurrection, and God of eternal life. You have no equal. Lord Jesus, you breathed the Holy Spirit on your disciples. You said, receive the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we long to receive the Holy Spirit as your disciples received it. The ones who were sent out by you. Jesus, you said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus, thank you that you have sent us too to be your witnesses to the unseeing, hurting world. Breathe your spirit on all of us again. Jesus, you say that your words are spirit and life. May we love, study, and contemplate on all your teachings, Jesus. And now the words of the Lord's Prayer will be on the screen for us. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So just a few invitations. Be joining in with. Um, first is that we're in the middle of, or just towards the end of, something called Christian Aid Week. Christian Aid work 24 hours a day all through the year. We will support all through the year as well, but there's a big focus at this time in May, and we had an afternoon tea which raised a huge amount of money. Well done. But it was mainly about raising awareness last weekend, and that will all go into the funds for whatever's happening during Christian Aid Week. Um, the East Church, um, our sister church along the road, and they typically have something this weekend, but they've rearranged things because of Pentecost and various other things. So they're actually going to have a coffee morning next weekend on the 25th. So if you're around and you can join in with that, that would be a way to support. There are on the website, if you're interested in Christian Aid, you've never given to them before, there are ways you can do that for gift aid. That's why they're on the shows this week. And the other thing is just to put in your diaries, the 2nd of June, 2nd of June, we are going to have another worship and waffles worship event. So that is an evening, half past six, here back in the sanctuary, transformed. Um, a really dedicated time of promoting and using worship, musical worship, as a time to connect with God. And um, lots more of the songs that you hear on Sunday morning in um, a more concentrated way, but also a time to open up and listen to what God is saying. And folk from all churches and none come together, and then there's a huge amount of fellowship over the food, the waffles, and the that. So we invite you people to go forward to that on the 2nd of June. And then just a third week of saying we still have one or two opportunities for those of you who've got spaces in your cars when you come on Sunday morning. You know how hard it is to come here without somebody to chat to. So there are one or two people who would love to get a lift to church. And if you're somebody who's got capacity to do that, let us know and we can add you to our team of drivers. I'm going to invite Sally to come and lead us in our meeting this morning. The reading is taken from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, 
residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Thank you, Sally. It's uh, Pentecost Sunday reading is like drawing the short straw. You know, like names of all the different places. And forget the first slide up, please. This is Pentecost Sunday. It doesn't get a huge amount of press in the church. Um, everybody is generally aware, especially if they're outside the church, that there are festivals or times of the year when the church celebrates different things. So what we see Christmas is a high when presumably if you're outside you think God invented presents. And then Easter comes quite quickly after it, but also celebrates a death and is presumably when God invented chocolate. <laughs> and then sometimes people hear about other things during the year, and one of them is Pentecost, which doesn't really in many places have taken a significant thing about it. Sometimes people have maybe a birthday cake, <coughs> or a suggestion that maybe Pentecost is the birth of the church. I've had a few issues with that anyway. Andy wants to discuss that with me in the <laughs> do that. However, it is a, a celebration that's in the Christian calendar. However, it's in the Christian calendar because, and the clue is in the word Christian, everything is at the center of what we do in this community centers around the story of a man called Jesus from Nazareth. And we focus on his life and his death and his resurrection for a number of different reasons. One of them being the fact that everyone agrees that he turned history upside down. That he was a real man in a real place who completely changed history. And we all in some ways have to deal with that. What sometimes people struggle with, and especially people who aren't really engaged with church or haven't taken the time to actually read any of the accounts of his life, death and resurrection, is they get surprised that Jesus of Nazareth was Jewish. They sometimes assume he must have been a Christian. He was never a Christian. He never became a Christian. He was always Jewish. And he always talked about it as if he was revealing more and more what the Jewish faith was always about and what God was doing and doing next. And as a Jew, he celebrated Pentecost. So that's where the start comes of the reason that we have a focus on it every year. And what I've got up on the screen comes from a book called Leviticus. So one of the first five books of the Bible known as the Torah, the center of the Jewish way of life, is a book called Leviticus. So in their story of their people, the Jewish people, they had a time when they were slaves in Egypt and God rescued them from that slavery and then took them into the desert and then talked to them, explained to them that they weren't to be slaves any longer, instead they were going to be a blessing to all nations, part of what this God was doing in the world. And he gave them a way to live and he also, in Leviticus, gave them a way to connect with him and part of that were seven sacred assemblies, seven feasts, seven festivals spread out through the year. And some were days, some were whole weeks, some were things you could do in your home, some were things you had to travel to Jerusalem to be part of what was happening in and around the temple. And today we are thinking about one called Pentecost. Next one. Pentecost in Hebrew would have been known as Shavuot. In Greek, the word is Pentecost, and any of you who are at all mathematically minded will see, well, pent must have something to do with five, or multiples of five, and that is true. In the Greek, it's Pentecost because it's 50 days from another festival, and that festival was known as Passover. Sometimes it was known as the Feast of Weeks, because 49 days is a set amount of weeks from Passover. Sometimes it was known as the Festival of the First Fruits, because it actually came at a time of year when the harvest wasn't over, but you were starting to see what the harvest may be like. Next slide. Each of the festivals that God gave them, these sacred assemblies, these feasts, had a different part of their story attached to it. And part of this was getting together, being together, connecting with each other and with God and remembering their own story. And so Passover, as I mentioned, happened around, happened around about March, April time and reminded them of the time I'd mentioned when they were slaves in Egypt. 
And when their God came to them and rescued them by passing over them and afflicting the Egyptians, but also just different place to the point where they finally let them go. Pentecost comes 50 days later. And that's the point in their story after Passover, after they escaped from Egypt, how they wandered in the desert, but they came to a mountain called Mount Sinai. And at that point, <coughs> their God spoke to them and explained to them a way that they could be the people they were made to be. And so Pentecost is the festival where they remember that part of the story, where they came to Mount Sinai and their God talked to them and gave them the way, the Torah, these first five books that we have in this collection of books we call the Bible. Next time. In the story of Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection, we see him celebrate the different festivals. And so, for example, Matthew 26, it's in the other Gospels as well, he celebrates with his followers at the Passover together. And he actually transforms that particular Passover meal into the meal that we now celebrate and call communion. And then we have the rest of that week, and we have his death, and we have his resurrection. And then he goes, he says, to be with his father, and he leaves his followers. And 50 days after that, we have the festival of Pentecost. And that gets picked up for us in a book called Acts, we read today. It's like Luke part two. Same author, we think, as the Gospel of Luke. And it carries on. And here it tells us what the followers of Jesus, particularly the 11 followers who were left, who have been his students for these three years, were doing at Pentecost. So Passover's happened death and the resurrection, and now we're at Pentecost. Next slide, and as we heard today, suddenly, while they were in this room, there was a sound, like a violent wind, and we talked about this with our kids a couple of weeks ago, we told them the story. Um, they saw what seemed to be like tons of fire that came and rested over their heads, and that all of them were filled with something called the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to do that. Next slide, we've got an artistic representation from classic art of the followers of Jesus gathered in this room with these tongues of fire above their heads. And there would be the sound of the wind, but also the sound of voices. The sound of fire and the sound of voices. Next slide. The story that they would have been remembering at Pentecost is the story of Exodus when they escaped from Egypt, they traveled in the desert, where God led them to a mountain, Mount Sinai, and he appeared to them as fire, smoke from a furnace, and the mountain trembling violently with fire on it. And then Moses speaks to God, and God speaks to the whole people. They can't cope with it, but he speaks to the whole people. So in their story of Exodus, where they learned the people they were meant to be, there was the symbol of fire and the sound of voices. And Luke, who's writing this, next slide, wants us, especially as Jewish listeners, to understand that it's the same God at work. The same God at Passover and the same God at Pentecost. The same God from Sinai, the same God from Exodus. And here we have the symbol, he's being clever here, the symbol of fire and the sound of voices. It's the same God and the same thing is going on. Next slide. What we're then told is that they were then enabled to speak and they went out and they started to speak and they spoke to the crowd, and people were amazed to hear in their own language, and people were amazed at the confidence they had, and that 3,000 people were added to their number that day. And that's not an accidental figure either, because after that point on Mount Sinai, where God was speaking to Moses, and he spent time away from the people, he came back, and they had forgotten all about God, and tried to make an idol, and tried to worship that, and 3,000 people ended up dead after that day, and here we are, with 3,000 people. Added. And it's as if Luke is saying, this is God working again. And he's changing the story from what it was before into what he wants to do, which has always been about restoration, about resurrection, about moving things forward. Next slide. What has happened? Well, we don't know exactly what's happened. What we do know is that the disciples were hiding in an upstairs room, unsure what to do, <coughs> terrified because people were getting killed for being followers of Jesus. And yet, after this experience, they then went out, were confident enough to speak, speaking in all sorts of different languages, and continued to spread this far wider than just this little city or even this little country. 
And that is because of something that here is mentioned as the Holy Spirit. And the Hebrew word for that is ruach. The Greek word of that is pneuma, where we get pneumatic tires and all those different things. And the heart of it is the idea of spirit or breath or wind. And again, the ruach is something that isn't new. It's something that's right there at the heart of their story of God being with them. Right way back to the poems and songs in creation where before anything was created, the ruach of God hovered over the waters and was there as part of what God was doing. And it's talked about in the same breath as God. And when God creates, he creates by speaking and breathing. He breathes life into the first human. So Jesus, as we've heard, breathes onto his own disciples in different ways. And that symbolism of the spirit, this breath and this wind is the presence of God. And it's the presence of God that changes, transforms these followers of Jesus who don't know what to do and are hiding into people who can be the people he had made them to be. Next slide. This is not new. This is why I might argue this is not the birth of the church. It's not that something new started exactly here except something happened here that created the conditions where we now understand what God was doing all along and we can be part of it because Jesus' is life and death and resurrection has taken away all the barriers and also God's presence is felt perhaps in a different or a more intense way through his spirit now rather than Jesus himself. This is not something new, this is a promise being kept. Jesus himself said this earlier in the story, next slide, at the start of this book in Acts, Jesus said to them before he left them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will then be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, the symbolism is here and then wider and then everywhere. And he doesn't say you might, you could be my witnesses, you will be. This is Jesus keeping his promise. But it's a promise that isn't just Jesus' promise, it's God's promise when he created the world. He created a world to reach its potential. He created a people in the middle of that to be a blessing to that world and put that on show. And all the time he promised to be with them. And here he is just once again keeping his promise. Next slide. What did these followers have to do to have this experience, to gain this confidence, to gain this energy, this power? What were they doing? Had they studied extra hard? Had they worked really hard? Had they got a test right from the life of Jesus? No, what they were doing, next slide, is they were hiding. They had no clue what to do. They were terrified and they were hiding. The only thing that they were doing is that they were together. They were together and they were following the rhythms of their Jewish life and the rhythms they had spent with Jesus. And he had celebrated Pentecost every year and they had come together to celebrate Pentecost and they did not know what to do and they were hiding and yet this happened to them. This is not a reward, this is a gift, this is a promise kept. Next slide. And it's not just for them, that's what we keep getting told, it's for all of us. Not because we earned it, not because we deserve it, but because we are made to be God's witnesses, his hands and his feet. Not because he needs us, but because he loves us, and he knows how much we're going to get out of it. And that's so why we celebrate every year Pentecost, because at the heart of this is a God who has promised everything, has kept all his promises, and then has done everything to take everything out of the way and to make everything possible, and then invited us to respond. So let's take a couple of minutes to reflect and to respond.
Let's pray. And now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go with you all now and always. Grace.